okay so broadly speaking say so our our discussion is about human nature understanding human nature and then transforming human nature so i'll talk about duryodhan and we'll continue the story in due course but some background for analyzing how things can be changed how somebody can change and when somebody can't change so basically we could say i talked earlier about the more outer power we get the more inner power we need to use that outer power well so now what does inner power mean normally you might think inner power simply means will power this will power is i decide to do it and i'll do it now that is that is yes important but will power is only one aspect of the inner power because will power can also be used for terrible things mm-hmm. somebody might be uh, cruel and they might be determinedly cruel so that is what we will see happen to duryodhan his one scheme got thwarted and then he started hatching bigger schemes so basically inner power is not just will power inner power is actually a combination if inner power is to transform us positively if inner power is actually to do good inner power is a combination of will power and conscience will power is if i desire to do something if i plan to do something i will do it conscience actually tells me what i should do and what i should not do conscience is like our inner moral compass we all have a conscience we all have this compass there are certain things which you start doing hey maybe i should not do these things maybe i should not do this maybe i should not speak like this maybe i should not do like that so something also prompts us now do this so there is this voice within us which prompts us do this and don't do this so now if we consider how these two interplay with each other conscience and will power that will determine how a person functions so broadly speaking we could say that the conscience and the will power they could be on a spectrum from weak to strong and uh, some conscience can be on a spectrum from weak to strong and similarly will power can be on a spectrum from weak to strong now when that happens let's consider these four possibilities that <clears throat> so in this four squares the conscience is weak and the will power is weak that means that person is basically doesn't know what to do but doesn't even have strength to do it so this person basically will be worthless they will not, they will not do anything good they might do something harmful but even to cause harm some amount of application some amount of determination some amount of uh, efficiency is required so they will the people with weak will power and weak conscience won't they will be they will be irritants but they will not be big trouble makers mm-hmm. then if we consider somebody has weak conscience and strong will power that means that there is no inner restraint for them for whatever they do on other side if they decide to do something they will go to any extremes to do it and that is extremely dangerous so we could say among these four categories this category somebody with weak conscience and strong will power is the most dangerous kind of person we see people demons like ravana and others they perform a lot of austerities they have that strong will power to perform austerities but then they have practically no conscience and that's why you can just go and abduct somebody else's wedded wife you can go and uh, violate anyone you can do brutal things so those people who are the most harmful those who cause the biggest harm are those with weak conscience and strong will power then we could also have strong conscience and strong will power now they are the most virtuous in society they are they are the most powerful they know what is to be done and they will do it so they are best suited to be the leaders of society they are principled they are powerful and they can what they if they act they can do a lot of good to society 
and if we have strong conscience and weak will power that is when we are tormented tormented because we know i should not do this this is bad but still the force comes so strongly the urge comes so strongly and we can't resist it and this is where it's it's torment it's misery now if you see from a outside perspective somebody might say that what a what a terrible person somebody just keeps relapsing into drinking or uh, some bad habit or whatever drugs or whatever and then uh, they we may feel this person is what kind of person is this keeps relapsing but even among those who relapse there's a big difference between those people who have strong conscience and those people who have weak conscience now those who have strong conscience they genuinely feel bad about it and they want to do something about it so most of us where will we be what do you think tormented yes <laughs> we are all <laughs> we all especially if we are practicing bhakti trying to practice bhakti means at least something within us tells us this is good we should do it but bhakti has so many principles and they are not so easy to practice so if our conscience is strong and our will power is weak we live in a tormented state now when i talk about these four boxes they are not necessarily static we can move from one to the other box so now those who are tormented and uh, those who are tormented if they become purified then where will they go powerful. powerful yes they will rise from the tormented state to the powerful state where the strong conscience and strong will power that is what we all aspire to do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so when there is this inner torment so generally whenever there is a war between two parties and those two parties are such that they are never going to come to reconciliation then there are two ways in which that war can end if a and b are fighting and a and b are never going to be reconciled one way is that a becomes weak and b wins the other way is b becomes weak and a wins that is the only two ways if there's no reconciliation so actually when people are in a tormented state of strong conscience and weak will power that torment it's it's not very it's not bearable it's painful that can be resolved in two ways one is by strengthening our will power the other is by weakening our conscience the other is by weakening our conscience where we go toward the other direction now <clears throat> what has happened if you see in broad western history and the whole world's history is now mirroring western history because westernization is spreading all over the world as soon as god was rejected gradually morality started getting relativized that means the people's inner compass started getting fuzzy more and more so now say if god is if there is no god if you are not accountable for our actions then why should i not do what i want for my enjoyment i should if i can get away with it and if my conscience traps if conscience torments me then conscience is just a is just a something meant to repress me from my normal behavior from my natural enjoyment and therefore get rid of conscience and for many people their moral compass is very much fuzzy today it has become very fuzzy probably say one example uh, which in the mainstream world would be quite controversial but in devotee circle we can appreciate it is it's say with respect to abortion now biologically speaking the child is the it's consciousness over there and it is a child mm. Mm. but so all over the world people were always doing abortions but it is never considered to be a right thing to do but gradually as social structure started collapsing as there was in the 19 1920s around about something which is called the sexual revolution even the western society before that was quite conservative 
But sexual revolution was the idea that free sex is the way to fulfillment. And because of that, family started, family structure started eroding and then multiple factors came together. And because of that, basically sexuality started becoming more indiscriminately indulged in. Then at one level, sexual morality at least was respected. People might do something uh, extramarital or whatever, but at least they knew it was wrong. I was, I often when I give classes, I speak about how you know, the family structure is collapsing, the divorces are going up. So I was in New Zealand, and the devotee who hears, hears my classes, he told me, you know, you speak this about divorces are increasing. He said, he says, don't speak this, don't speak this in Australia, New Zealand, because it's not true. I said, what do you mean? He said, divorces are not increasing. He says, no, they're not increasing because marriages are decreasing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> people don't get married only. So people's moral compass has become more and more disoriented. And naturally, uh, because of that, now when people are not getting married, that doesn't mean they are not sexually active. They're sexual, they are still sexually active, and then uh, they just feel pregnancy is just something which comes in the way of my being sexually active. And so, abortion has moved now, it has become oh, it's not actually a child, it's not actually a child, it's just a tissue, and the tissue we are removing. So, what happened gradually that whatever sense of wrongness was there that was removed, and many people. If actually, if somebody is trying to do abortion, if they are shown uh, the embryo in the womb, and I can see actually the embryo is like a child. But it's literally like a child, it beats like a child, it's shaped like a child. But uh, they are never shown that. In fact, now according to some laws, the, the, mm -hmm. there was a movie on about abortion, it is called Unplanned. I had a review of that on my website. It was basically, uh, this uh, woman in Texas, she she was herself the head of abortion clinic, and under her, like twenty four thousand abortions were done. But she never knew actually what happens in abortion. So one day, the, during there was like a, some abortions are uh, what is the word for it? They are guided with so they are so they are so, they, are so, they are guided using some sonography kind of thing. So because the embryo may be a little the embryo fights for life in the, the suction pump or whatever goes inside the embryo tries to run away from it and if they are not able to catch the embryo then they have a sono live sonography going on so that the the technician or whoever is operating they can guide the probe in such a way that they can catch the embryo and then crush the embryo so then so this woman she saw this for the first time and she was horrified and after that she got transformed. She resigned and she has become a anti-abortion activist now. Mm -hmm. So now when this happened, she said that I was in this industry for over a decade, but I myself didn't know what actually happens. So what has happened now, if, uh, if a woman wants to do abortion, then uh, some of the pro anti-abortion activists said at least show them what the embryo is. And there are some aggressive pro-abortion campaigners. They say this is this is violence against the woman because if she sees that, she'll be traumatized. And so, to protect her emotional health, don't show it to her. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, you don't want to traumatize anyone, but it's a matter of life. Okay. It's a matter of life. So now it is see from this tormented. I do something wrong, you feel tormented. But from there, if things are just allowed to glide on, you'll go not. From tormented, one might go not only to the income where we are just dead and don't do anything, but it can go to the most dangerous level also. What is most dangerous? Now there are some aggressive pro uh, pro abortion campaigners. The Prabhupada would say that if a man Prabhupada would recommend sexual regulation. He said if a man and a woman unite, the man the man goes away, the woman becomes pregnant. And then she has to she has to deal, bear the responsibility. So now, what women say, what this is aggressive anti pro abortion campaigner says, that actually, this is nature's unfairness to women. And their argument, as is their slogan, is pregnancy is biological slavery. 
and abortion is technological liberation oh, this is pregnancy is not slavery it's a privilege to bring new life into the world but this is where things have gone to this strong willpower and weak conscience mm. so where the consciousness has become so deadened not only they don't think it is something undesirable something wrong they think it's like our right nature has been unfair to us that why should we if we are sexually active why do we have to bear a child for that so abortion is technological liberation now this is so, so basically the point i'm making this is just one example and i don't want to go further into this but the example i'm giving is that the states are not static if somebody so another way to they talk yesterday about weakness and wickedness no so see weakness and wickedness are two different things weakness is where some generally when somebody is in that area of strong conscience and weak will power that is weakness that is that tormented we all have weakness within us weakness is where we know what is right but we are not able to do it so sometimes our lower desires alas anger greed just overwhelm us and then we do something wrong but after that we regret it so weakness is more or less hot headed so what is called to what we call as tormented that will be same as same as weakness but different from weakness is wickedness wickedness is where the person has no consciousness at all conscience at all they deliberately do wrong and delight in doing wrong so wickedness is uh, is extremely dangerous weakness can be forgiven but weak wickedness to forgive means the person will keep doing the same thing again and again and again so so duryodhan was had not just weakness he had wickedness so weakness is hot headed wickedness is cold blooded cold blooded means that person systematically plans this is what i'm going to do and this is how i'm going to do this and this is how this person can be hurt the most and this is how after doing this i won't be caught after doing it so when somebody goes to wickedness to transform them is very difficult it's possible but it's very difficult because the con generally somebody can be helped if they want to be helped but if there is nothing within them telling them that they are doing something wrong then what will uh, then how can you help them if they understand i am doing something wrong and i want to correct it then they can be corrected but i am not doing anything wrong i am doing something but i am okay so when somebody starts saying like that then it's very difficult to help them <coughs> duryodhan eventually he when krishna uh, comes as the uh, peace messenger to him uh, and just avoid the war give the pandavas their kingdom back give the pandavas at least five villages back and then his father his mother the sages over there they all say accept krishna's proposal don't be foolish don't be demoniac and he starts saying why are all of you criticizing me he says even if i introspect i don't see any wrong in what i have done i only protected my interests and if i have done i have simply he says i have simply acted according to my nature so if anyone is to be blamed the creator who gave me my nature should be blamed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this is very perverted reasoning he says did god give us our nature well it depends on what you mean by nature if we could talk it or lust anger greed and we pride and illusion that god didn't give us that is by our own actions we have got that of course god god can still redeem us he can still help us to reform but to blame that which we have acquired by our own misdeeds if somebody is an alcoholic and he say god made me an alcoholic mm. well god didn't make you an alcoholic mm. if god had made you an alcoholic then you would have been born with from your mother's womb with a bottle in your mouth with a not a milk bottle <laughs> a bottle of something else but nobody is born like that so at this stage when somebody goes to the level of wickedness they are almost irredeemable still they can be redeemed 
they can be saved they can be reformed but it's very difficult very very difficult so now of course when we are dealing with people most of the people around us in our relationships they will broadly be in the level of weakness some people might be strong some people might be tormented some people might just be incompetent so basically but understanding this categorization if somebody is weak we need to support them so that they can get elevated then weakness if it is fanned if it is so weakness and wickedness they are different but still they are on a spectrum if somebody so generally wherever there is weakness wickedness will not be far away wickedness will come to exploit weakness say for example in america in several states uh, the drugs drug there's a drug epidemic is it there in uk also or not so much is there okay so several states it has been declared as a state emergency now what happens there are students in colleges or schools life is stressful sometimes they have exam pressure sometimes they they their, their relationships are not working out and whatever they they feel depressed they feel lonely that's all weakness so weakness it is there and there are drug peddlers they have wickedness they just waiting they might even give some free samples initially so that the people the youth get hooked and once they are hooked they'll be driven they'll be dragged down so wherever there is weakness wickedness is often nearby and then if weakness and wickedness come together the wickedness it drags the weakness down the the wicked person gradually starts making the weak person also wicked so the same person who the same student who would never ever have thought of lying or stealing once they get hooked to drugs mm. to get it somehow they may lie to their parents they may steal from may do some shoplifting steal from their home steal from their relatives start doing all kinds of bad things so the weakness and wickedness that combination is very bad because then now if weakness is associating with goodness that's good then that person can rise up also yeah any so i'll i'll now with this and uh, typograph with this broad perspective broad framework we'll go ahead with the story of duryodhan but any questions about this framework till now yeah concepts can be elevated say by spiritual education or knowledge hmm. how do you uh, change the way path uh, i'll talk about this all all of these at the end okay. how to into all of these is that okay yes there is a question yeah. we talk about wickedness and weakness so would that uh, duplicitous is the same thing it depends on what your duplicity is about you know if is duplicitousness will get come to weakness or wickedness it depends sometimes there are small things which are people cover up you know say somebody steals some prasad i said i didn't steal it you know okay it's not very harmful you might say that duplicitous but that's not a serious thing but maybe somebody steals a lot of money and then they try to night that is so that is quite serious so let us see also duplicitous is basically you are not uh, we are not transparent about what what we are and to some extent that is there in everyone unless we are pure devotees so but it is it is a it differs on what it is about so the wicked people are definitely both weak and wicked will be duplicitous but the activities about which they are duplicitous is big difference because um bakshi and thakur said that the duplicitous cannot chant the holy name yes i would say in that case the duplicitous would that duplicitous will refer to wicked okay. where you know they, they don't feel like chanting they don't feel the need to transform themselves uh, they feel i'm good already and they feel this please devotees that look look down look down upon them they're wasting time what are they doing so much so they they cannot chant because they have no impetus to chant they, they don't feel its value at all a medicine has value when i am aware that i am sick if so a so when you say when he said a duplicate is can't chant it not everybody has a tongue and everybody tongue has a capacity to chant that way but they have no impetus to chant just as a uh, person who, is, who thinks they are not sick they will not even value the medicine mm. 
Even if the medicine is there in front of them, they will not care for it. Like that, the duplicitous will not care for the holy name at all. Okay? Thank you. Yes? Yeah, association. So, if somebody is at the level of dangerous, then are, are they almost irredeemable? Well, again, sometimes some, even when wickedness also, I would say it's I am giving that as one name, but it's also a spectrum. Sometimes some people might occasionally do something wicked, and some people might habitually be wicked. There's a difference in that also. So, if somebody is addicted to something which is seriously wrong and they are just going on with it and sometimes they say they want to reform but again they keep relapsing and especially if they start justifying concealing rationalizing then in, i have given some seminars on mental health and addict, on spirituality and addiction so one of the things is that there's something called uh, codependency codependency means say one person is addicted and then the other person starts uh, protecting the doing a lot to protect the other person but then what happens say somebody is alcoholic and then their partner or their sibling or whoever their parent they, this person has an episode there's something crazy in alcohol because of alcoholism and then their their codependent comes and picks up the pieces all the time and then what happens? They just keep doing it again and again. So sometimes, when somebody is going from that weakness toward wickedness, going from that, where they just, they don't even feel I'm doing anything wrong, then sometimes some hard decisions are required. And one hard decision is that sometimes we have to stop protecting people from the consequences of their actions in the name of love. You have to stop protecting people from the consequences of their actions in the name of love. So, I was I was in America at one place, and then the, for my talk, one 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 middle-aged man had come along with a very small girl. So then after that, they were talking with. They said, "Yes, she is my granddaughter." They says, "My daughter was a my daughter became a drug addict," and then. She would take money from me, I beg money, and sometimes she would steal money, small, small amount. But one day, she she broke into my house when I was not there. She stole all my life savings, all my life savings, whatever there, some some thousands of thousands of dollars. And then at that time, she was so frantic that she left her child alone. And that's small, maybe three, three and a half year old child. She left her alone at home, and somehow maybe she had not switched off the oven or some gas or something. And a fire broke out over there. Unfortunately, the neighbors saw that and they alerted and they called. And then she was saved. But when these, both these things happened, she stole all my money and then she endangered her child also. So till that time I was helping her. I said, now nothing is doing. She said, I filed charges against her and I filed for custody of my granddaughter. And then, mm, because this was the first big crime, like stealing away, so she was not sent to a jail but she was sent to like a rehabilitation center and she was furious she said how dare you take my daughter away from me what kind of father are you and she she cursed me like anything it was very painful for me but he was saying right now as she's becoming rehabilitated she they had a phone call she said she just called me a couple of days ago. she said that what you did was the best thing for me now of course whether she will be reformed fully or not we don't know but the point is sometimes uh, the consequences are what create the desire within the person to change. Not the desire, oh, I, want, I would like to give this up. No. I have to give this up. Right? It's not just a casual desire, but a serious desire to change. 
So then after that we can talk about resources. So resources can help only when there is the desire to change. So and sometimes the desire to change has to come because of uh, witnessing the terrible consequences of our actions. And the resources can be manifold as I said basically the resources for transforming they will be not just spiritual they can be social also social support system can be there like again same thing see among these factors the past karma we can't change the upbringing we can't change uh, but the association we can change and even with our past karma and our uh, upbringing you know, these are all factors which push us they don't force us when they push we can counter push the precise english words i use is they impel us they don't compel us impel is we are pushed 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 and it can be a very strong push now if we want we can counter push and if we have the right resources we'll be strong enough to counter push also but if we have no will, no will only to counter push then we will be we just go away with the, with the pushings that come from inside so what we are talking about at least creating the will to counter push and then after that how to counter push that is something which will come later does that answer your question thank you so any other questions at this stage okay so now with this okay what is this oh this got lost huh? okay sorry so with this uh, typography uh, uh, this framework now even if we give duryodhan the benefit of doubt and say that initially what he had was weakness now of course vidura said that from the signs this child has very strong negative impulse neg strong tendency towards vice so even if we say that he was not born wicked it's a little difficult for us to think of children as wicked children are generally considered innocent and mischievous and even if we ag uh, agree to that but still his conspiring to kill bhima was not just weakness it's understandable when he feels envious or he was respected and suddenly the issue is being respected it's understandable when he felt angry when he felt peeved when we might just threw him away like that but then he's gliding toward wickedness and the world is such that in a sense what we desire to do often the world facilitates us if somebody wants to take drugs they'll find places where drugs are available or even drug dealers will come to them so what happened for him he was already moving toward wickedness and then something terrible happened to him there's another wicked person who came in his life who was that shakuni shakuni so now duryodhan had the association of virtuous people like vidura like bhishma like drona but unfortunately see whose association we have is not as defining as whose association we value i might have very virtuous people with me why are they why you people are just moralizers you speak big big things you just criticize me then that's not very helpful that value uh, whose association we have matters but whose association we value matters far more and when shakuni came in his life he started valuing shakuni's association the most now shakuni had his own agenda like we say drug peddlers they are not interested even for the student they said definitely not interested in student's welfare they are not even interested in providing the student some relief they are interested in their own money although they might act act in a way that they, they apparently they they concerned also if they act sometimes like that so in his case what had happened shakuni was how was he related with duryodhan uncle Mama. uncle Mama. yeah so maternal uncle so now what had happened was that when uh, bhishma had come to the gandhara kingdom with a proposal that, you know i want your daughter to be married to the kuru dynasty so they the kuru dynasty was a very prominent dynasty and they said it's honor they agreed that that time shakuni thought 
that Gandhari will marry Pandu and she will become the queen. But when her hand was now Bhishma, this is the first match that Bhishma had sought. And Bhishma felt that first the older brother has to be married. So naturally, he had Gandhari married to Dhritarashtra. And now Gandhari, she is relatively speaking a virtuous lady, although she was very strongly attached to her son and not entirely virtuous, but at least she accepted her fate. And she started uh, serving her husband and living reasonably. She uh, with him. There's no incident, there's no description anywhere in the uh, in the Mahabharata that Draupadi resented her marriage to Dhritarashtra. So not Draupadi. Gandhari resented her marriage to Dhritarashtra. She accepted it and she she lived with him. But Shakuni felt cheated. Shakuni said a great injustice has happened against my sister. And because this injustice against, against, against my, has happened against my sister, I will get back. And how? He said, Bhishma has caused this. Bhishma is responsible for this. And he could see Bhishma loved the Pandavas. So he says, by creating dissension between the Kauravas and the Pandavas, by destroying the Pandavas, I will get back at Bhishma. And then he also thought that, okay, even if Gandhari could not become the queen, she can at least become the queen mother. And if she becomes the queen mother, then I will have royal privilege and power because I will be so close to them. So he had his own agenda. And unfortunately, what happened is that he had his agenda and Duryodhan just lapped it all up. Duryodhan, he felt, oh, my scheme didn't work. Yeah, maybe I need somebody who is smarter than me. Here it's not just smarter, it's wilier, more vicious, and but not just vicious, but also more cunning. And that combination, you could say, was horrible. And then that, Duryodhana himself was on the path of ruination. But when he coupled with Shakuni, it was, as you could say, almost his fate was sealed. And so much so, that even when Draupadi was dishonored, dishonored and attempted to disrobe her in public, actually, not only did that time he not feel I was doing anything, I was here laughing maliciously, but afterward also, there was not the slightest remorse. His conscience had practically died by that time. So even when the Pandavas came, just asking for five villages, Krishna came, there's five villages. Now, what did Duryodhana reply? He, if he had a little bit of conscience also, he would have said, no, I'll give you know, what is because five villages, I'll give you half the kingdom back. And even giving the half the kingdom back does not actually undo the offenses that he has done. But leave alone seeking forgiveness, he was not even acting according to basic decency. So when he told Krishna that, I will not give you, I will not give even enough land to put the tip of a needle through. That what is he doing? That is not just a say, no, no. It's like a banging door, like banging the door in the face of someone who is asking us something. And like say, suppose we invite somebody for a program and they say, actually, I have to go here at that time. I have to do this. I can't come for the program. That's one kind of no. Uh, at this point, we say maybe they have a desire to come, but they are unable to come. But if somebody says, even if I die, my dead body will never come to your program. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if somebody says something like that, that would mean that it's not just that they, have, they are unable to come, it's they have no desire to come, they are ever, completely averse to it. So Duryodhan, by that time, by Shakuni's association, by his repeated wrongdoings, he had gone to that level. And at that level, it was when Krishna said, and when he spoke this, I'll not give enough land to even put the tip of the needle through. Then Krishna said, Oh Duryodhan, war is inevitable and your destruction is also inevitable. So if somebody stays on 
on the side of wickedness, they will cause a lot of harm to others and they will ultimately destroy themselves. This is what Duryodhan did, unfortunately. And I was planning to talk about several other characters also, like B, B, uh, contrasting Arjuna and uh, Karana or Yudhishthir, but we won't be able to go into that right now. So let's consider what could Duryodhan have done right. Mm -hmm. And based on that we will discuss, if we are in that zone of tormented, in zone of weakness, how can we go from there to strength? So like I said earlier, first thing he could have valued the good association he had. He could have, but he did not do that. So basically, <coughs> there are four broad steps by which we can strengthen our conscience. Now the same steps can also work for strengthening our willpower. So if we are either of these, if our willpower is weak or willpower is strong, but main thing is, if our conscience becomes strong and then our willpower becomes strong, then that will be very well situated. So what are these four steps? The first is action. Right, so action, association, education and purification. A, A, E, P, A. It's first action means what? See, all of us, even if our moral compass is fuzzy, still we don't know certain things are good and certain things are bad. Some people, I was giving a talk in Amazon, in America, in so there, there somebody asked this question about moral relativism. And you know, actually all morality is relative. I said, okay. Uh, then I said, is there anyone in the world who is doing something that you think is wrong? Said, of course. He said, there are terrorists killing so many people, innocent people, there are... There are sexual predators who violate people. There are child <coughs> abusers. There are many people who are doing terrible things. Now, I said, let's stop. Do you think that, uh, that many of the, not do you think, that many of the terrorists don't think that they're doing anything wrong? They think they're doing something right. Mm. So now, if, if morality is entirely relative, if you think it is right for you, it is right for you. If you think it is wrong for you, it is wrong for you. Then, what it would mean is that what they are doing is right. Terrorists are blowing up innocent people. They think it is right, then it is right. Said, no, no, that's not right. That's horrible. So I said, okay, you are saying morality is relative. But then, you are saying that in this case, morality is absolute. Isn't it? Even if they think it is right, it is wrong. So, the point here is that there can be some aspects of morality which are debatable. Some people say this is wrong, some people are, some other people say this is not wrong. But everybody has a moral compass. And now whether their moral compass points to the true north. That means that whether their, what they, their innate moral compass says this is right and this is wrong. Whether actually that is right and that is wrong, that is a matter of discussion. But everybody has these moral categories. Everybody has a moral sense. So, we may not be, sh even if our conscience is weak, even with the weak conscience, we know that certain things are right and certain things are wrong. And with that weak conscience, we start doing what is right. Because of the weak conscience, we may not, may not be able to do certain things. But certain things we can do. Say for example, when lust comes upon us, when anger comes upon us, when greed comes upon us, we may not be able to resist. But well, these vices, they do not torment us constantly. It's like if you consider the graph, say if somebody has anger, it's not, nobody is 24 hours seething with anger. Even if somebody has lust, lust levels are also different. So if you consider the graph versus time, it's like sometimes this surges up. After that it is down and again it might surge up. So now by action what we mean is even if we can't resist our urges we can persist between our urges. Persist means okay you may not be able to do the right thing when the, when the urge becomes very strong but the remaining time do the right thing. So uh, we may not be able to say overcome our anger or lust or our greed or whatever 
but okay, I can come to the temple. Maybe I can come for some satsang. I can, I can, I can do something positive, but as much as is possible for me. So our our moral compass is like a muscle. If we use the muscle, that muscle will grow. So even if say, somebody has been fractured and they have, they can barely move their hands. One of my friends is a bodybuilder, and his hand was fractured. And then the doctor told him that you have to now start exercising. He said, I cannot lift my hand. What exercise can I do? Doctor said, can you lift your little finger up? He said, yeah. So he says, okay, 10 times every hour you just move your little finger up. That's your exercise. Said, exercise? For exercise like pumping iron in the gym. Said, this is not exercise. He says, no, this is your exercise. He started doing that. And then within the day, he was able to move his full, all his fingers, then his palm, then his forearm, and then gradually full mobility came back. Now, at that point, that simple finger moving up and down would seem insignificant. But actually, it is not so insignificant. This is what I yesterday also talked about that in a different context, in terms of dealing with different discouraging situations. But one discouraging situation can be our own inner problems, which we are not able to overcome. So the same point, S, S, S. Does anyone remember? Was anyone there yesterday? Simple steps. Yes. Small, simple steps. steps. S, S, S. So action means, just start with, okay, with your weak moral, con weak conscience, still, what is the good thing that you can do? Start with that. Small, simple steps. Once we start doing this, that's the first part, action. Start doing what you, or the good that you can do and try to avoid the good, the bad you can avoid. Now there may be some good you may not be able to do and there may be some bad you may not be able to avoid. That's fine. But at least do the good you can and avoid the bad you can't. Start with the action. Even if it's a little, little lifting up of a little finger. That's the first thing. A is action. Second A is association. What association essentially does is that association fuels our desires. In fact, the essence of association is the transfer of desires. When do we know whether we are associating with someone? It is when their desires become our desires. We might spend a lot of time with some person, but, but if you're not even talking with them, you're not spending much time with them, there's not much sharing, then it's not really association. Association is transfer of desires. So, if we associate with those who have virtuous desires, then gradually their desires will start coming upon us. Our desires are not just linear, they are also triangular. Linear means that I see a particular thing and I desire it. See a particular object and desire it. Triangular means we see somebody else doing that and then we desire it. So, often, uh, virtuous behavior, I might say, I want to be honest. Okay, that's good. I want to be truthful. I want to be self-controlled. That's okay. The desire is there. But sometimes, see what happens, self-control, honesty, truthfulness. We can't really see them unless we see them embodied in someone. And so, there are some, in the world, many of the world's promises, world's objects, they are like, many sense objects are like visibly attractive. And we see them and we get the desire for them. That's a linear desire. I see the object and I get the desire. But our desire is also triangular. That means you don't just get the desire by seeing it. We get the desire by seeing someone do it. So I'll give an example for this. Does any of you know what is baklava? Okay. How many of you know? Okay. Most of you. I, four or five years ago, when I first went to Australia, five, six years ago, I think, I didn't know what was the baklava, so I had gone to Australia. I had gone to a devotee's house, and the devotee, we had gone for prasad, and then the devotee said, for dessert, we have got baklava. Would you like to have? Now, I had never heard of baklava, and the name baklava is not very sweet. <laughs> baklava, okay. <laughs> so I said, maybe later. Hmm? And then there's another devotee with me, he said, yeah, give me. Then he took the baklava and he was eating it and he was savoring it. And I looked at him and I said, give me also one. 
<laughs> so, just hearing or seeing the baklava did not create the desire. So, there was no linear desire. But there was triangular desire. Seeing somebody else eat the baklava, I also want to eat it. So, similarly for us, virtuous desires very rarely develop linearly. Virtuous desires usually develop triangularly. Just by uh, hearing an abstract, oh, we should be honest, we should be self-controlled. That doesn't really trigger that desire so strongly. But we see somebody who is virtuous, some, somebody who is honest, somebody who is self-controlled. Even if you see a Bhagavad Gita, how many of us after seeing a Bhagavad Gita, oh, I want to read a Bhagavad Gita. Well, maybe a few of us. But if you associate with somebody who is reading the Bhagavad Gita, relishing the Bhagavad Gita, deriving fresh insights from the Gita, yo, I want to read this. So, association. Association taps the triangularity of our desires. Quite often, vicious desires also de develop triangularly only. But vicious desires or lower desires, lust, anger, greed, they might develop even without the triangularity. I might just see something and I might, somebody might see an alcohol, I want to drink it. Of course, if they have alcoholics, they will become worse more. But this is the second point. So now, our conscience can develop even through association. If somebody has a strong conscience and some, we are with somebody and they are in some trouble and they have that situation where they can get out of the trouble by speaking a lie and then they refuse. They refuse to speak that lie. They speak the truth and they get into some trouble but they take that up. And we say, oh really? I should also speak the truth. Also basically what happens is triangular desire. So association. That, that is, first thing was Action, second is association, third is education. Education means that what is right, what is wrong. Sometimes there's a lot of moral haziness. It's like a moral mist. We don't know that. But when we study scripture, study books like the Bhagavad Gita, study Bhakti texts, then they educate us. Now each of these, what I'm talking, it applies to willpower also. By action, if we do a little, if we exercise a little self-control, say I can't fast whole day, but let me fast at least till noon. If I do that, then gradually I'm exercising some self-control. So action also applies like that. So for willpower also the same thing applies, education also. Then after that, sorry, action association apply for that. I mean education at one level, education uh, clears the moral mist. Okay, this is right and this is wrong. Now how does this happen? Especially scriptural education gives us, helps the vision to see the consequences of our actions. Earlier I said that you know, love means that sometimes we stop protecting the loved ones from the consequences of their actions. But another aspect of love could be help others to see the consequences of their actions. You know, so in general, uh, I was with an, see, one of the senior most leaders of our movement, he's a sannyasi guru, so he was telling Prabhupada, he was doing college preaching in Prabhupada's times. And Prabhupada told him, he said that the worst thing that you can do in our college programs is present Krishna consciousness as a set of rules. He said, nobody is interested in following rules. He says, what we need to do is give people a multidimensional explanation of why to do something and why not to do something. If you do this, this will happen. If you do this, this will happen. If you do this, this will happen. And that's the whole mood of the Bhagavad Gita. At the end of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Yathech sita kuru. Do as you desire. But before that, Vimrishaitad asheshena. Deliberate deeply. And then you do as you desire. So the Bhagavad Gita doesn't hand out rules. One of my friends wanted to write a book on the Bhagavad Gita for a Western audience. So he said, I am writing the book, the Ten Commandments of the Bhagavad Gita. So I told him, please don't write a book like this. Because the Gita's mood is not a mood of commandments. The Gita's overall mood is the mood of choices and consequences. If you do this, this will happen. If you do this, this will happen. So now, education, basically scriptural education can give us this vision of choices and consequences. And then that can inspire us to act in the right way. And the last is, purification. 
So purification essentially means bringing ourselves in contact with the all pure Krishna. So Krishna is all good and if we connect with him then by that we all can move towards virtue, we all can move toward goodness. The more we connect with bringing our consciousness in contact with Krishna, the more our consciousness comes in contact with Krishna, the potential for virtue will start manifesting more and more. And the propensity for vice will start getting cleansed. It is uh, darkness, the best way to remove it is by turning on the light. So similarly, the best way to combat vice is not to combat it directly, but rather to uh, connect with God. It's uh, within us, whatever lower desires are there, if we try to say no to them, it, we it always keeps, creates a sense of deprivation. Why can't I do this? Who says I can't do this? But instead, instead of focusing on saying no, we focus on saying yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we may feel, oh, this is a terrible thing and I, want, I don't want this. I want to be saved from this. See, what we are saved from is not as important as what we are saved for. What we are saved for. Okay, if you became free from this, we have, we have anger, we have greed, whatever we have. If I become free from this, what will I do after that? What do I want to do? What are the positive activities that I want to fill my life with? So if we focus on those positive activities, and use our spiritual, use our imagination to see how we could grow in those positive activities. So if somebody, uh, maybe I'll conclude with one, one or two examples, and then we'll start, I won't go over time much, that somebody has a habit of spending a lot of time, maybe on their phone, on their internet, social media, maybe somebody spends one, two hours every day, just surfing the net. And then if somebody says, oh, I'll stop doing this. Well, we stop for some time. See what happens? If we make a resolution, I will not do this. The mind comes along sneakily with an eraser. And it erases the not. <laughs> so I will not do this becomes I will do this. So what happens? Rather, okay, I don't nah, I don't want I don't want to spend so much time on, on social media. But instead of thinking what I will not do. Think of, okay, this, I spent two hours on that. What will I do with the two hours? What is the meaningful thing that I want to do? And try to channel yourself in that direction. Once we do that, okay, maybe I want to read the Bhagavatam. Maybe I want to attend this class. Maybe I want to do this course. Maybe I want to do this. So focus on the positive. And the more we connect with the positive, the negative will fall aside. So purification also doesn't mean just give up the impure. Purification means primarily connect with the pure. And the more we, if we understand that, I, I don't just want to give up this life of weakness or wickedness. I want to have a life of goodness. I want to have a life of purity. I want to have a life of godliness. And we pursue that. And we can pursue it even while we have weakness. Because weakness, as I said, doesn't trouble us all the time, 24 hours. So as we start filling our life with, with Krishna, with the positive, things related with Krishna, gradually the darkness within us will start going away. So the weaknesses within us cannot be driven out, but they can be crowded out. Driven out, get out, get out, get out, get out. No, it will not work. Hmm? So, but crowded out. Just fill your life with positive things. And the more your life is filled with positive things, with pure things, the impure will automatically go away. And thus, the potential for virtue that is there within us, that will manifest and that will help us to become powerful, principled human beings who can do a lot of good during our life journey in this world and ultimately we can attain Krishna at the end of this world, at the end of our life. So thus, we can make have contribution and the supreme destination. Both coming forward, if we rise from wherever we are to this level of strong conscience and strong willpower. So I'll summarize so what I spoke over the two sessions. I started by talking about 
are people innately good or innately bad? There are two different theories. And if we look at our own lives, we start as babies who are naive, thinking people are innately good. And if we have bad experiences, then we might go towards cynicism. People are terrible, people are bad. In between the two is the courage to trust. And how do we develop that courage to trust? So we need to understand human nature. So I talked about, are we innately good or innately bad? The communist, so leftist idea is that people are innately good, society makes them bad. The, the, Judeo, the Christian, Judeo Christian idea, at least at some level is that because of our sin, because of the original sin, we are all innately sinful. But the, the Gita's understanding is that there are two levels of innateness. That at the level of the soul, we are all we are all good because we are parts of God. But at the level of the mind, depending on the impressions there, the mind left to itself, the mind gets very easily impressed by vice. So we have a potential for virtue and a propensity for vice. And the potential for virtue has to fight against that propensity for vice to manifest. And when some people, when the Bhagavad Gita says some people are demoniac from birth, uh, they are ungodly, that means not that their soul is ungodly, but rather there is a lot of negative impressions within them. The propensity for vice has come from their previous births. Then we talk as a case study the story of Duryodhan. That he, based on the symptoms at his birth, it indicated that he had a lot of vice from the past life. And that's why he's told, Duryodhan's father was told, abandon him. And the more outer power we have, the more inner power we need to maintain, to use that outer power responsibly. Otherwise, we will cause, the, the amount of outer power we have, that much havoc, that much damage we will cause out externally. So that's why he was told that, don't, Duryodhan can live, but don't let him live as a royal heir. Because he will use all the royal resources to wreak havoc. But unfortunately, the Trashtra didn't listen. And then we saw how initially he was pampered. We talked about the contrast between growth. The, a certain amount of deprivation is helpful for motivation and character formation. Mm -hmm. Like I talked about immigrants, children doing well, but once they get naturalized in a new country, in three, four, gener two, three generations, the advantage goes away. So similarly, Duryodhana grew up as a pampered child with all comforts. The Pandavas lived in austerity and they grew up to be much more cultured. And when Duryodhana saw that, all my, after the Pandavas came back, that, that all the attention and affection is now going to Yudhishthir. And Bhima is stronger than me. He just became envious. And he, at that teenage, he plotted to kill Bhima. So, he, uh, there's not just weakness, but there was wickedness. Because it's not just that he felt envious, but he acted in a diabolical way, making a whole conspiracy. Weakness is hot-headed, wickedness is cold-blooded. And what he did was cold-blooded. But it backfired. And Bhima came back stronger. So now when we do something wrong, and it does not give the desired result, either we can stop doing it, or we can do it more. And if we keep doing the wrong things, then things will become much worse. So, and for him, Shakuni came over there. So I talked a little bit earlier about how, for us, there is this potential for virtue and the propensity for vice. And we need social checks for it. That is, society has a system of justice and law and order, that is social check. But beyond that, there is a spiritual check. So for the propensity of vice, the, vice, the spiritual check is fear of God. And for the potential for virtue, the spiritual fan, which will, which will make it manifest forth is love for God. So in his case, he had no fear because I thought I am the king. And, he just, and then on top of it, as our behavior is shaped by our past life karma, our upbringing and our association. So he already had bad past life karma. The, all those vices were there. His upbringing pampered him further. And then when he got the association of Shakuni, he just became even more wicked. We talked about how wherever there is weakness, Wickedness lies nearby, waiting to pray. And then the weak, weak and the weak, the wicked can make the weak also wicked. Then we talked about this four boxes that somebody has strong conscience and weak willpower. They are tormented. Somebody is weak conscience and weak willpower, they're just incompetent. Weak conscience and strong willpower, they are dangerous. That's where wickedness is. And in strong conscience and strong willpower is the virtue, is that they are powerful, they are principled, and they are 
they're the best in the categories, the four categories. So he talked about how we can move up. So if we stay in weakness, we'll go toward wickedness. These categories are not static. Uh, uh, if we keep indulging, we'll keep doing more and worse and worse. But we talked about how we can be transformed positively. So I talked about four principles. That's the A A E D to us. A A P. A was what first? Action. Action. So within even nobody is an absolute moral. Nobody is a total moral relativist. We all have a conscience. So within whatever compass we have, we try to do the good and avoid the bad. Small simple steps like just the exercise of lifting up your finger, little finger. Start with that. And second A was association. association. That our desires are triangular, especially virtuous desires are not triggered linearly as much as they are triggered triangularly. I'll give the example of Baklava for that. And then third was education. Education, that education is it, it is essentially meant to give us the vision to see the consequences of our actions. And codependents, they sometimes guard their loved ones from the consequences of their actions and thus their things become worse for them. Now, we shouldn't guard others from the consequences, but we can give them the eyes to see the consequences. So rather than giving rules, scripture is not just about commandments. At least Bhagavad Gita is not about that. Bhagavad Gita is about choices and consequences. So when the education comes, okay, this is what this will lead to this. I don't want this. Then our conscience can become stronger. And the most important way for, you know, for changing ourselves is the last one. That P was purification. We connect with Krishna. He's the all pure. And the more we connect with him, we'll become purified. And that's why bhakti is not so much a process of saying no to vice as saying yes to the supreme virtue. Our lower desires can't be, can't be driven out, but they can be crowded out. Rather than worrying about what we need to be saved from, we can focus on what we want to be saved for. What do I want to do with positively with my life? And once we focus on that, Whatever negativity is there, gradually it will be driven out of our, it will be eliminated from our consciousness as it becomes filled with the light of Krishna. And that's all of us in our life journey. If we can come to that level of strong willpower and strong conscience, then we can do valuable things in the world, we can make worthwhile social contribution, and at the end of our life, attain the supreme destination. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Shila Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Tai Gaur Premanande.